Good afternoon and welcome to this week's episode of Rachel Gaffney's Real Ireland live from the Lincoln Centre in Dallas, Texas. And today is November the 27th, the day before Thanksgiving. Hi, Anna. Happy Thanksgiving. Hi, Rachel. I'm so excited. It's Thanksgiving and we, we are have a very topical show today. Oh, don't we just. I'm feeling a bit hungry. We're going to be going straight in talking about food and Today we're not going to be talking about pumpkin pies or turkeys. That's probably somewhere in the cookbooks that this lady has written. But it is very, very appropriate that we are talking to a woman who embodies food and what's so special about food. So she has been dubbed the Julia Child of Ireland by the San Francisco Chronicle. And that is um, none other than the famous Darina Allen from East Cork, uh, the very famous Ballymaloo House and Ballymaloo Cookery School in Ireland. She is a tireless ambassador for food, for Irish food, both at home and abroad. And along with, and she was also very instrumental in setting up the farmer's market movement in Ireland. Um, she is just passionate about food. She is one of the councillors for the slow food movement in Ireland. And along with her brother, Rory O'Connell, she and Rory set up the world famous Ballymaloo Cookery School back in 1983. And to this day, this cookery school is thriving and people are coming from all all over the world to attend this cookery school. Well, good afternoon, Darina, and welcome to Dallas, Texas. Ha <laughs> ha, lovely to be here. We're thrilled to have <laughs> you here. So for people watching, uh, we've told them who you are and, and what you do, and I thought we'd go straight into it <laughs> and talk about the lovely, uh, we'll start at the beginning with um, where it all began, at Ballymaloo House and <laughs> Restaurant in East Cork in, in Ireland. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could tell us really briefly about Ballymaloo House, and maybe you could show some photos in the background, Anna, of, of Ballymaloo house we might run some of those but where did it start how did it start well um, as you can see from the photographs it's a huge big old country house in the middle of a 400 acre farm and my parents-in-law um, Myrtle and Ivan Allen they when the children had all gone to school in the 60s to boarding school they were rattling around in the house so my mother-in-law uh, uh, Myrtle Allen decided she'd open a, a little restaurant in their house and this one's considered to be a totally crazy thing to do then because it was right out in the country miles away it's about over half an hour from Cork City and uh, people just didn't open restaurants out in the country at that time and she wrote the menu every day depending on what was in the uh, gardens and what food was available in the local area we're very close to that little fishing village of Ballycotton as well so there was lovely fresh fish and so it was the first country house hotel in the British Isles and uh, you know considered to be a crazy idea but Myrtle just from the first day she um, served the f sort of food that you'd serve to your family and friends and uh, she said she'd never have more than 20 people uh, but now of course she's looked back on as a total pioneer or oh, there are sort of terms for everything she did it's of course totally farm to fork uh, you know everything all oh, the food is all cooked from scratch uh, you know the all of these kind of terms that uh, people talk about now it was always sustainable it was all part of a sort of circular economy and but nowadays uh, you know, Myrtle is looked on and quite rightly as somebody who led the way, a woman who was really liberated without even thinking about the word feminism or anything like that. Yeah. So happy in her own skin, totally aware of the importance of, uh, you know, looking after her family and also of, you know, uh, highlighting, as she did, the beautiful food that was in the local area. And I mean, 
the food was always, she always served local food in season. That was just the way she cooked. It was the way she cooked for her children and indeed for guests when they came to the house originally. So I remember my husband, who was at boarding school at the time, saying, you know, they heard, they had got a letter and she said she was, the restaurant was going to be open. They'd heard a little bit about the chat about that. And so he couldn't wait to get home for holidays. He thought that, you know, they'd be, she'd be serving real food, like in a restaurant, you know, mixed grills and steak and chips and everything. And he was <laughs> disgusted to find that she was serving the same food to the guests as she served to them. But they had their own Jersey herd, so she was making, of course, homemade ice cream and uh, you know uh, and so they had their own pigs and cows and chickens and two acre walled garden with full of vegetables and uh, everything in season so you know and at that stage remember local in Ireland was almost a derogatory term so the idea of serving local food was sort of instead of foie gras or truffles or something was considered to be you know why would you do that but Myrtle always knew how incredible the, the, the produce that we have in Ireland is you know we're a small country with a very high percentage of rich fertile soil wonderful fish from our coastline so we have beautiful ingredients that you know and for any cook or any chef it's all about the ingredients so if you start off with a piece of beautiful fresh fish or some lovely you know fruit or vegetables you need to do so little to make it taste totally delicious whereas if you start off with mass-produced denatured food then you have to be a magician that's where all the twiddles and bows and smarties on top come in when you're trying to uh, compensate for the fact that the food wasn't that the flavour wasn't there in the first place. I heard you sing a comment earlier on which I loved. Anna, uh, you'll appreciate this. Was the tweezer-free kitchen? <laughs> yes. You know where everything is sort of you know um, no disrespect to people who are artists in the kitchen and everything, yes. but you know I think most of us, truthfully, Dorina would love a bowl of stew or a shepherd's pie or you just said having Jersey cows yes. and having homemade ice Beautiful cream. Beautiful Jersey cream and we make our own butter as well. Do you? Uh, from our, uh, we have at the cooking school we have a little herd of Jersey cows just eight or nine cows so we make our own cheese and butter and, and yogurt and the butter is yellow, dark yellow from the, of course the cows are as all uh, cattle are in Ireland pretty much are out grass fed out in the field so we have that wonderful rich colour. Yeah. yeah. Now going back to so when Myrtle started this in the 60s and was the restaurant, then when did they start admitting, uh, or admitting, it sounds like a hospital, when, <laughs> when did they start accepting guests? Well, um, that was after, no, just three or four years, I think, okay. because people wanted to stay when they came out. They wanted mm. to stay for the night and there were already 16 bedrooms in the house. So um, Myrtle and Ivan decided they would do up, uh, I think it was 10 or 11 bedrooms and that okay. then they could automatically uh, get a spirit license as well if they did that. And uh, so they, uh, and then then people start to stay and then of course uh, when people arrived it's really funny because we have such a repeat business I mean the Ballymaloo is over 50 that was 1964 I think they started 1966 or 7 uh, they had bedrooms but we still have people who are brought as children bringing their children back again to Ballymaloo so they're in this case the third generation are coming back to Ballymaloo and uh, it's like coming back for a family a family holiday every year. It absolutely yeah. is. I have an aunt yeah. living in Cork who was recently at a wedding and it was at Ballymaloo and it's her best friend who lives in Ballycotton yes. right along the, you know, the, where the little fishing village close to yeah, us. Yeah, she lives on the waterfront there yeah. and she got married there recently. She's an older lady now, but she had her wedding in Ballymaloo. Yeah. And so it's funny how, yes, you that's just a little nostalgia there for yeah. me. But and what, so and when they came to stay, uh, the kids, you see, love it as well because they can run down onto the farmyard and play in the bales of hay and play in the sand heap just outside the door and be real children just run around and then there's a children's tea every evening they collect the eggs and bring them up and have them for supper and so on so but they love all of that you shared your philosophy because yeah. you came along uh, you had your background was in uh, you were trained and you well I, I did hotel you see um, I was uh, at this stage now I'm 71 mm -hmm. and at, when Fabulous I was at, at boarding school with the Dominican nuns in, in Wicklow they were encouraging us girls to have a proper career you know they were very visionary nuns you know do meds and do science do law do architecture and all I wanted to do was cook right. and uh, because my mother loved to cook and knew the importance of feeding us well she used to save you know she knew that our food should be our medicine and she used to say well if you don't put the 
effort into the food on the table, you'd give it to the doctor or the chemist. And but so basically, um, but all I knew was cooking or gardening. We had a kitchen garden and a house cow and all of that at home as well. And so I, the nuns were disgusted with it. Well, you know, disgusted is a bit of a strong word. They so you're never going to need to be able to cook, my dear. You know, you're going to have somebody to do that for you. And so I really insisted. Nice but, but at that stage, men were chefs. I mean, cooks and, and, and uh, 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 you know, and also they had no status. It was years before celebrity chefs. So, the, you know, the, uh, the, and the subliminal message was that these basic practical skills were of much lesser value than ac academic skills. And it's still the same emphasis in education, you know, the STEM subjects. And we're now letting thir three, our third generation out of our houses without giving them skill, the basic skills to feed themselves and out of our schools. So this is a crisis really too. But anyway, so I had to do either hotel management or a degree in horticulture. And I decided to do hotel management. And then still my dilemma, you know, where would I get a job? I couldn't get into any of the top restaurants in Ireland and you could have counted them easily on one hand in the late 60s um, because as I said men were the chefs with the high hats and so on so I was very fortunate you never know in your life what's the tiny thing that can change the rest of your life and in this case it was uh, one of the senior lecturers met me one day in the corridor knew I hadn't got a job yet and all the others had because you'd have been a you'd have got a job as an assistant manager in one of the posh hotels and I didn't want I that was another name for slave as far as I was concerned and I really wanted to cook so I told her what I wanted she told me I was far too fussy and then she said, funny, I was at a dinner party the other night and they were t my the hostess was telling me about this woman down in Cork who's opened a restaurant in her own house out in the country, miles away from the city. And, you know, they, you know, make their own ice cream. And, and uh, I had a fixation about making ice cream, to re all that sort of thing. And, I, and they have a kitchen garden. She writes the menu every day. Remember, that was considered to be outrageous or, or really amateurish, actually, to open a round menu every day at that time. And uh, anyway, I couldn't believe my ears. I thought that's perfect, but she couldn't remember her name. So she went back and came back a few days later with a piece of paper. She handed me a piece of paper and she said, this is the name of the woman, write to her. And so I wrote right to, to Myrtle and uh, I then became a member of the family by the simple expedient of marrying the boss's son. So that's how it's done. <laughs> so that's how you came Alan. I came to Valley Valu and uh, of course I loved it from the moment I arrived. And she, Myrtle reinforced all of my mother's values around food. And you know, there were you know, when the gooseberries were in season, they'd be on and, or mackerel or whiting. These are sort of foods that were never seen on restaurant menus at that time. I remember local kids would come up to the kitchen door uh, with, uh, with little tins of wild blackberries and mushrooms and sloes and damsons and she'd put those on the menu and all of that for those forage foods which people just we didn't even know the word foraging then so Myrtle incorporated those into the menu because she was writing it every day and so I remember years later somebody saying to her you know quite you know not very long before she died you know you were such a pioneer you know you did all of these things that now everybody is wanting to say they're doing and all of that and she she said well you know, if you live long enough, they come round to you in the end. Was, <laughs> so she was so. But I she don't was think doing she, what came naturally to her. Uh, she was, was doing what came naturally to her, and yeah. people absolutely loved it. And and within a couple of years, she had the top rating in the food guides in the British Isles. And of course, at the Ballymena Cooking School, which we established in 1983, we follow exactly the same philosophy. And what made yeah. so you you founded the cooking school, the cookery school, in 1983 with yeah. your brother Rory O'Connell? Exactly. And that has gone on from strength to strength. Yes. And actually, it's amazing. Within two years we had our first American student I remember I changed my little brochure from um, Ballymenu Cooking School to Ballymenu International Cooking School and I remember this lovely girl called Tabby Dillon from America am I the inter the I an international but it always surprises people that people come literally and have for a long time now from all over the world uh, to the Ballymenu Cooking School because it's a non-farm cooking school it's in the middle of a hundred acre organic farm and we have acres of garden we have an, uh, an acre of greenhouses we have ten acres of garden actually Ten acres. Vegetable and herbs and uh, herb garden and everything, and also an acre of greenhouses. So basically, the students can learn literally how to cook from the farm to the fork. They go out with the gardeners in the morning. They can go down and learn how to milk a cow and make butter, cheese, and yogurt and forage and ferment. And the bread shed is open at six in the morning. They go in and make learn how to make sourdough bread there. So they people love learning. That's and you know, I give a special welcome to American uh, students because I know what they've had to go through when they tell their friends they're coming to. 
to Ireland to a cooking school and they say, are you crazy? Ireland, you know, because the image of Ireland years ago was a, the land of corned beef and cabbage. It and still my unfortunately God, is a little bit Well, here. it's like totally different to that now. Yeah. I mean, the food we have, we've, you know, grown so much in confidence. Of course, people travel more and more and realise you have to travel to realise often what's what you have under your own nose is so brilliant. And now so in pubs and little cafes and restaurants and hotels all around the country, uh, the food is wonderful. I mean, you have to do a bit of research like you have to uh, when you go to any country but you see we have such beautiful produce and wonderful we can grow grass like nowhere else in the world so mm. our dairy products you can get our lovely butter over here the Kerrygold butter and and uh, you know our beef and our lamb and our fish of course so we're like so favoured by nature uh, and so now it's not when people come to Ireland it's not just for the friendly lovely people and you know our landscape which is mm. so beautiful you can be absolutely assured you're going to have delicious food um, yeah, all the can, time yeah. Yeah. yeah and I can vouch for that because I have been to Ballymaloo and <laughs> in fact I was there in September and I, I must get this photograph and, and I was telling Doreen earlier on I must get it and share it with you guys um, I posted it on my Instagram page but and I didn't know this. I was bowled over. We, we were all sitting around having dinner and then dessert came. And along came your lovely <laughs> sweet trolley. That's right. And do you remember the days of a sweet trolley? Yeah, um, it's like so, it's 70s, isn't it? I love it. All, it, yeah. all I could think of so was my grandmother. Because we used to yeah. go uh, to restaurants and hotels, you know, for your first communion, your confirmation yeah. was a big deal Celebration. to go. Yes, and we would go to, um, I remember my mum and dad used to go to our beauty Lodge, if you yeah. remember, and all those. Oh, and the Ryan's. And, yeah. and, but I remember my grandmother, her first thing always was to check out the sweet trolley yeah. before dinner yeah <laughs> but anyway I noticed yours was particularly beautiful yeah. and then you told me yeah. that you went to an well, award it's, it's ceremony just in won Paris the world restaurant awards uh, trolley of the year award in Paris at the inaugural awards this year it was like the Oscars of food awards right. and that's Jay Aura, our pastry chef you see this wonderful ho that homemade ice cream is different every day made with the Jersey cream and so on served in that bowl of ice and then the meringues all the different things and we always have carrageen moss on as well that's an Irish seaweed I was going uh, to say would you yeah. explain to people about the carrageen, carrageen. moss maybe a little bit yeah. and the pudding or what you well, do with basically it basically it's it's also so important that you know that one can serve one not only local food proudly but also give people a taste of our food culture in Ireland and a lot of people would think that food culture in Ireland are uh, anathema but we have so much but so one of the things that's absolutely part of our food culture is a, sea a little seaweed called carrageen it means little rock in Gaelic and we pick it off the little rocks over near Ballyandrine early on in the year we traditionally it would have been spread out on the grassy cliffs and uh, bleached by the sun and washed by the rain and then you bring it in and it lasts for years and it's absolutely loaded with iodine and other trace elements and it doesn't taste of iodine but then it's a natural gelatine as all of the seaweeds are and super good for you and uh, so we make a lovely light um, carrageen moss pudding with that and serve it with uh, uh, some Is that always on your menu? It's you? always that's okay. on every night on the yeah, sweet trolley because people we can't take it off no. and then every, every other then everything cha every changes every night but uh, basically uh, and we serve it with a soft brown sugar and some Jersey pour cream and oh my god are you god. hungry yet Anna listening to this <laughs> I am are you hungry oh my god yes I am well and that it brings, sounds delicious well that brings me into you know talking about you know the the, the moss the seaweed sorry not this moss the seaweed oh, yes, that be in that one, and actually. so this is one I brought this in because this is one of my favorite books which is the forgotten skills of cooking now that book I think came out in 2009 or it something? did and it won the Andrew Simon award which is uh, was so exciting for me because that's the kind of Oscars of cookbook awards and this is literally you you know, I, this came about because I was in the kitchen in the cooking school one day, and I we have we uh, we have a we have hens of course, so we have uh, hens buckets in every section, scraps that from the cooking in the morning go into the hens bucket, uh, and come back as eggs a few days later. It's all part of the kind of circular thing. But anyway, I met a student making a dash, kind of looking a bit flustered with a bowl in her uh, hands, making a dash for the. And I said, she looked a bit flustered. And I said to her, what's that? She said, oh, I was whipping cream and it's gone too far and I'm going to give it to the hens, which would normally be a, a, a good thing if rather than throwing it out. Yes. And I said, no. I looked into the boy and said, no, you've made butter. You've almost made butter. We just So this girl, five weeks into a 12-week course, by the way, yeah. um, had knew, I think, that butter came from cream, but had no idea how it got from cream to butter. And so I just got, uh, you know, I put it back onto the mixer, beat it up. And by then, three quarters of the class, 
castle around me and wide-eyed looking at how butter was made and I thought oh my god I, I, these, these skills are forgotten and I as a child of course had learned how to make butter with my great aunt in, in County Tipperary and so I immediately started to write a book on forgotten skills and we have a whole series of forgotten skills courses as well oh, you how do. to yes how to make butter cheese and yogurt how to cure a pig in a day how to build a smoker and smoke your own food how to make all of you know ferment foraging of course uh, for wild food so they all uh, so this book was literally written as a result of that chance encounter in one of the kitchens one day so if you see this one here which is the the how yogurt yo making look, and that yeah look at how the yogurt is so thick and beautiful that's just the jersey milk and and the yogurt culture live and yogurt if you want culture. to you know do this yourself at home, you yeah. can no but if you don't want to do it yourself you want to go learn how to do it i strongly suggest that you actually sign up and we'll have the links up for bally maloo um cookery school because they do 12 week courses they do five week courses and they do half day courses and sustainable f food production courses uh one days as well and if you're in the area you can just s swing in for an afternoon mm -hmm. we do a cookery um demonstration every afternoon and then of course we do bespoke courses as well so and it's the cooking courses and all of these other forgotten skills courses as well so and, and the gardens by the way are open to the public as well oh, or all, all year round um they're you know acres of of garden and so on and, and a shell house that people can and a quarter acre celtic maze actually i forgot to tell you that oh you do yeah but look you talk about oh we're looking at pictures of your lovely gardens coming up there yeah. so um yes this is a ballymaloo house yeah beautiful yeah, which yeah. is uh, the cookery school is down the road is not on the grounds of ballymaloo house that's just down the road it's only yeah, about it's about five minutes uh, yeah about it's two miles so it's very yeah. very close and that's in the middle of a hundred acre organic farm and what we don't produce ourselves we buy locally from a whole network of farmers and fishermen and cheese makers and fish smokers we have about 150 local producers who uh, who we buy directly from as which well which leads me into my question i wanted to ask you because i know that you you know the word um i am actually almost allergic to the word passion sometimes because everybody's <laughs> passionate about something nowadays yeah, and it's um, a bit overused well i think it is yeah. it's like the word yeah. uh, super everything is super yeah. um but the word passion and i think passion you know you said about myrtle you know people say she was passionate well it's just because she believed it yeah and i think if you believe something and it's kind of the way it comes out yeah and it wasn't a conversion on the road to damascus it's just the way uh, we were but really, you are passionate yeah. Yeah. <laughs> about sustainability yeah. and I'd really like if you could just spend a few minutes talking about you know both in Ireland and even over here in the United States and in general how we cook how we eat how we yeah. you know what, what do you, you know, see happening changing or well thank goodness there's a conversation about it now and I think people okay. are becoming more and more aware that there is an absolute crisis and our food needs to be our medicine so all we need is real food not edible food like substances as Michael Collins uh, Michael Pollan says mm -hmm. and so but where to get it is the thing so link in with if you can I know everybody's so busy and in fact this book one pot feeds all is dedicated to you know the busy young people who are trying to keep all the balls in the air you know feed the kids and and race home from work all of that but basically what we need to somehow or other to get to farmers markets maybe link directly with the farmers and more and more over here I notice now there are more and more small farmers that will sell direct to you so it's just real food and the food then is the nourishment and you then you don't have to spend a whole ton of money on supplements and vitamins and minerals and so on it, you know I was brought up to know that mm -hmm. uh, th to know that as a real fact so and I mean when everywhere I talk to people they're worried about the health of their children they're worried about what's going on so there's a growing awareness but of the importance taking something everybody's of got something in their handbag so, here yes but in a Drugs. way I think you know, sometimes people say to me, and I say, for goodness sake, get as much. The older I am, the more I realise it is vital to get food that is chemical free. You can call it organic, you can call it biodynamic, you can call it whatever you like. But really, we, we have enough toxins without our bodies fighting against more and so on. So people sometimes say to me, it's all very fine for you because the perception is that I can afford organic food or whatever. But hey, how much money are you spending on meds and on supplements and all the rest of it? And, you know, if, if one can give a little little bit more effort and time and, and time is such a precious thing and okay maybe a bit more money uh, investing it in the actual in real food real nourishing wholesome food my goodness the difference it'll make to your 
to your health and to the health of your children and to your to your lifestyle and for goodness sake cook uh, we, you know this is the other sad thing that so many people of my generation the next generation were told oh it's so super not cool yeah. to actually cook you know you can yeah. have you can have it all you can just go and heat up something and that's why often over here people say about talking about fixing food yes. rather than actually uh, cooking food but it is such a wonderful skill to be able to cook and it's so it really is easy somehow or other sometimes if there's something that you can't do you think it's a mystery I can t take anybody from this is a wooden spoon to be able to give a dinner party and feed their family well in just a week and or even in less you yes. know and my recipes and all my cookbooks are really simple and what is this new one this now, one is by the way this one is out in Ireland yes and it's already won an award uh, yes and this is on Amazon all, all the rest of it all the well time, this is my it? favourite one yeah. nobody can have this yeah and this there's Grow copy. Cook Nourish as well which is another one of the you ones that, did I show that photograph, yeah. Anna, of uh, Grow, Cook, Nourish? Because you yeah. said to me before, I heard you say that you think that was one of the most this, important this is the ma the works you've ever... The Grow, Cook, Nourish ever... book, it, it took me three years to write, and I think it's the most important book. Three I, years to write three that years. book. Three years, and it's the most With important book I'll ever write. the screen. And so... Th th um, yeah, there it that's, is, Grow, Cook, there. Grow yeah, Cook, exactly. Nourish. Okay, and that's and still that's, available. that's saying to people, for goodness sake, well, let's wake up and see what, what's happened over the last decade or yeah. two decades. We've just handed over complete control over our food choice to the supermarkets and the multinational food companies and look we can't expect them to and have our, our, our best interest too. at heart because I mean their responsibility is to their shareholders so our responsibility is our health and our uh, and the food and so on so but actually at the school we have one I, lo I love teaching people how to cook as well I, I, I mean I could be teaching maths or geometry but basically I we have one teacher with every six students at the, at the Ballymaloo Cooking that's School that's a great ratio so it's a great yeah it's I mean normally it's one to 12 or 1 to 15 so that's but it's such a you see if I teach somebody how to make a loaf of bread or soda bread or or a soup or something you get, it's all like giving them a gift for life and what then they can build on that. What did we just do two weeks ago Anna in here? <laughs> oh yes. You'll have that to tell Darina so what good. did we do? Oh my gosh so um, Rachel let me uh, punch my camera so um, Rachel brought us in amazing soup and oh, well the done. whole we all gathered Big around Luke, the Le studio. Big Lacruz thing of yeah. homemade it was soup. Incredible. Yeah. Homemade soda bread. Yes. yes. And we talked about um, soups and baking and I was saying you know does anybody make anything anymore just to give them to somebody as yes. well as a present the I joy know, I mean you I know you can people. it's so much better than bring a little a little a couple of pots of soup or something it's if you're going to to somebody for dinner or a pot of jam or a loaf of bread I mean it's so much better than a dodgy bottle of wine you know Ooh. and but Tell this us is about all this book how did this one come yeah. about now, I love this, this one again is desperate to you know, everybody's getting more and more bu busier and busier and busier. And in Ireland, as everywhere else, yes. you know, a dashing at, at work, dashing home through the crazy traffic, trying to pick up the kids in the crèche, you know, dash into the supermarket to get a few uh, ingredients. And then knowing the importance of putting something on the table. So this one is one pot feeds all. So every recipe in this, and I'm very, actually, I'm... I put so much effort into having this really yummy things. Everything is in one pot, one roasting tin, one baking tray, and there's they're putting lovely delicious puddings in it as well. Oh, and, uh, yeah, look so at this. and and things then they might it might be something that has potatoes in as well, like the quintessential. Uh, you know, a uh, one pot meal is Irish stew, actually, which in fact isn't in that because it's in lots of other books that I do. But basically, with beans, Lucy, this one has always oh, lovely beans and pumpkin, black eyed bean, pumpkin, and chickpeas, too. Super delicious uh, to use that overused term again. But there's all oh there's no, pearl, ba that one. pearl barley, uh, you know, with pearl barley, with rice. We even have one pot pasta dishes in it. And my, I thought I said to my editor, that's not possible. She said, try it. And I'm, I was, yeah, it really works. Oh my gosh! One pot okay, pasta one, I love the idea and this, this is really I dedicated to all those her busy heroic young people trying to keep all the balls in the air, saying, "Look, you can uh, take your slow cooking pot, or you can take just an ordinary pot, put everything into it, put let it bubble, 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 and then come home and just pop so it do you onto think anybody the can table." Make this? Yes. Oh, oh anybody right. can make any of my recipes, and Challenge. they're really well tested. So if if uh, do you if know who's challenging? <laughs> Who are we challenging? Sarah Crilly, the journalist here at Real News PR. Yeah, she get her to on, make this. Sarah's on a 
bent since I started doing the soups. Remember, she came yeah. in here. She's been emailing me and texting me every day. Yeah. She wants things that she wants to make for her family, soup or one pot. And yeah. She said, I can't do these things like you. And I said, yes, you can. Yes. So I'm going to see if we can get her to make this. I'm going to get oh. this recipe and give it to her. Yes, good. And um, and then I we're going to follow up yes. on air. What do you think? But you know what? We, we need in all what of our countries, yeah. in Ireland and here in America, we must get cooking embedded in the national curriculum again and also it's you know we need to get it made as a primary subject so that no kid can leave school without their final I don't know what you call it in this country A levels leaving cert without being able to prove that they can cook and if you can cook you're totally uh, in charge of you know your own health and all the rest of it and you can spread so much joy around and it's what memories are made of sitting down around the kitchen table Absolutely. with family and friends well I have to ask uh, finish on three questions if I may from people who have emailed or contacted and saying please 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 could you ask Darina these for us okay so this is from a lady in Ohio her name is Fiona Quaid and she's originally from Cork but she's been living here a long time <laughs> and she said um, first of all she said to tell you she has every one of your cookbooks and this is going to be her next one in February um, mm -hmm. but oh February. February February in 2020 by the way but we'll put the link up to that but Fiona wants to know she said she misses making bread pudding Aww. and obviously she used to buy you know Bread. bread in the grocery store yeah. at home which it's not the same here what she wants to know could you recommend any breads that she could buy here for making bread pudding well i think sourdough is a little bit strong for it so basically one of the french bread loaves or whatever uh, can be a couple of days old or brioche of course makes the most amazing okay. bread pudding as well and in i'm not sure if oh i wonder if there's a bread pudding in that one but anyway if she needs a uh, there? There, there's certainly in this one here there's a, a bread and butter pudding as we call it mm. and don't change it there's cream and and, um, and milk in it but make sure that you don't use low fat anything Just no, 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 no. go for it and, no. have it and it'll be the best bread pudding you ever had in your life <laughs> oh my gosh a uh, gentleman in Chattanooga Tennessee Terry Butler he wanted to know if you had um, he was interested in something we did recently we were talking about sage and different yeah. and basically it was about different herbs being good for you and as you mentioned about food being thy medicine even uh, Hippocrates himself said let medicine be thy food mm. let thy food be thy medicine yes just remember that but Terry Butler wants to know have you got anything that you'd recommend that we could possibly make with sage that you oh, like I love sage and sage the, the word of a lot of these the name of a lot of these herbs and things give you a, an insight into their medicinal qualities as well so sage yes. really good for your memory as well as is rosemary and uh, oh, really? yes exactly and for your uh, brain function all of that but uh, yeah we love sage we don't use it enough really I suppose the most traditional thing would be to put a little sage chop it up into a stuffing mm -hmm. roast duck or roast goose which is coming up to Christmas now but I also love little sage fritters so you could dip them in a very light little batter and deep fry them and oh my god or even not even put them in a batter just put do some olive oil in the pan and just throw them into the uh, pan and they'll frizzle up and uh, abs do you know what's even better then crack in a lovely fresh egg into it and then baste it in the sage flavored oil and it'll oh. get all crispy around the edges and then you have all these crispy sage leaves and it's absolutely delicious so there's so many good things and that other Tuscan thing where they make a little sandwich with a little anchovy two sage leaves a little anchovy in the middle and dip it in a light batter and deep fry them and have them just with drinks oh my goodness and the last question those yeah. are fantastic the last one I have for you is from a company in Ireland actually called um, Urban Aaron because I they're based in Waterford I follow those they actually make a lot of beautiful wool blankets so I'm giving them a call out they're lovely yeah. But they said, uh, she said, um, Rachel, I love that they keep this. She's referring to Ballymaloo House, yes. your restaurant and your your cookery school and every your philosophy. I love that they keep their food simple, non fussy, but absolutely packed full of flavor. Is this achieved through growing most of your own vegetable and herbs? Basically, they want to know what, how you keep your how, why your yeah. flavor is so great. We are and always have been passionate about sourcing ingredients. So it starts, what have we on our own farm and gardens and so on. And then we have, as I mentioned earlier, a whole network of small producers that we've built up over the years that we link in with to get, you know, who rear us ducks and chickens and geese. So he's quite right. It's all about the quality of the produce. And if you start off with this lovely fresh produce, then you can keep your food very simple. So people, you know, when they taste something on the plate, they go, wow, what was that? A lot of people, actually when they taste the food they think my god is that what carrots are meant to taste like or whatever they just have forgotten how good food that you know that's 
grown slowly and carefully in really rich fertile soil can taste and animals that are reared and birds that are reared properly for the table and then we celebrate them on a plate in uh, their life on a plate at Ballymew House. Well, I think that was a perfect way to end um, the segment on uh, with the question from Urban Aaron because really her question, I think, was more of a statement considering we just talked everything you've talked about for the last half hour that um, she asked that question which you had already answered <laughs> it's everything your philosophy and it didn't just start last week that's right this is a this yeah. is a lifetime it was not a conversion on the road to Damascus no. the way we always were and, and this still is not are. an easy road either yes. you know people look at you in 19 cookbooks and yeah. it's successful but there are bumps and bruises yes there's yeah. difficulties yeah there's hard work and labor and sweat yeah. and worry. Well, and that's the same in any business. And but so it on. does. Yeah. We got to remember that that goes yes. into it too. Yes, you know, quite. it's not luck. Yes. Right. Well, uh, luck and well, combination of luck and hard work. Generally Sometimes a does little it. bit or something. Yes. But so, yeah. if anybody wants to order any of the cookbooks, we'll have the links up. We'll also have links up to the social media accounts for Ballymaloo uh, House, Ballymaloo Cookery School. We'll show you. Uh, we'll give the links to everything, so you can stalk them on, <laughs> yeah. on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, and you can see they're sharing every day all their updates from the farm and yeah. I know that Dorina has a newsletter which um, you put out are you Saturday out musings oh well, yeah well, there's every week actually the Saturday, Saturday letter I write for the Irish Examiner every week and two pages in the weekend section so that goes up online as well so that's so right those are really and nice. if anybody's in the area they can just swing by any afternoon and Shanagari remind area, us where right? we met um, yes, we met on Rachel Gaffney's <laughs> Real Ireland all right. thank you Rachel well listen thanks a million for coming in well you know it's been a pleasure thanks it's so nice talking to you you too <laughs>